have an exciting guest who I'm going to bring on in just a moment, but monumental because my technology continues to upgrade. Now, for those of you who have done this for a long time, this is probably what you would think is a low budget production. That's all right. Um, but for me to have any kind of breakthroughs in technology is worth celebrating. So I even had a little graphic up there. Quite amazing. But welcome everybody to Prophetic Life. Hard to believe we've been doing this now about four years. And we're going as strong as ever. I haven't done any broadcasts lately. We've been doing the podcast. We've been doing some video with Destiny Image TV. But I really, I mean, this week we've got a bunch of exciting interviews. And yeah, I see some folks coming on right now. Welcome, everybody. Let us know where you are watching from. I'd say, what are you doing in quarantine or what you are doing presently? But just, just say hello to me. And well, without further ado, I'm going to bring on a really somebody I am just getting to know. His reputation really precedes him, though. Many, I'm sure, are familiar with prophet, teacher. I mean, he's a man who's worn many hats. I'm amazed even looking back. He was touched by God during the days of Toronto. God has used him not only in healing and evangelism, but what I so admire about Johnny Enlow, he's carrying a message for right now. Listen, I'm grateful for every soul saved and every life healed. 100%. We need to keep it going. But I do believe my heart burns, as I'm sure many of yours does, to see entire nations transformed by the power of the gospel of the kingdom. So I am going to bring Johnny Enlow on right now. And let's see how this all works here. One, two, and there, all right, there he is. Johnny, nice to see you. <laughs> Hello, Larry. So good to see you. This is great. Well, thank you. You're, again, you're, you get to be on this experimental broadcast where I've been doing these for a while, but I come on and in the back end, there's always no, all these interesting technical gadgetries that are um, shiny objects for me to play with. So <laughs> my, my, we're, we're learning as we go along. Johnny, could you tell me, because I'm curious, you know, could you share with our viewers a little bit about your testimony and your story? How, how did you, how did God get you? <laughs> that's kind of, that's a good question, you know. Well, I'm, uh, I was born in Peru, South America. Uh, my parents were missionaries. And so I lived most of my first 18 years there. I'm a fifth generation uh, minister, at least going back. And so I probably didn't have a choice. Uh, when I did get married with my wife 32 years ago, I did tell her, you know, we're going to serve God always, but two things are never going to do, never going to do the pastor thing and never going to travel to the nations. And uh, they're overrated, been there, done there. And of course, God loves to hear the things uh, that we're not going to do while we call him Lord. And uh, that is all we've done. We We were senior pastors of a church for 14 years and uh, have traveled the world over uh, for more than 20 years. And so it's been an amazing journey. There is a key moment. Uh, there's a before and after, we'll say ministerially, but no, it's not just ministerially, it's life as well. As I was touched uh, by God, 1995 in the Toronto renewal. I didn't really go there open, uh, open-minded open that much. I went there to uh, a little bit to judge, okay, what's the latest thing um, taking out these uh, crazy charismatics. And uh, I had been part of seeing some uh, really the wrong side of the charismatic world. And so I went there uh, because there, it had gotten a lot of attention in a short amount of time. And I was like, I need to get my own perspective. But I was touched by the Lord in a powerful way, not really shaking on the floor. It was just him. He just put his finger in my heart and it just changed everything. And And so, uh, you know, who grew was him. And um, I always quote A.W. Tozer, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. And when you serve uh, a little God, uh, I, I was feeling sorry for him. I had seen some of the deep corruption in, in the church at that time and been part of a situation. And I was like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. You know, your church is a mess. And and the whole process had diminished who God was in my mind. And so at Toronto, he just grew. And I started seeing him a little closer to the size that he actually is. And so I remember telling him, I said, if this kind of presence and this kind of power will go with me, I will do the nation's thing. And so immediately did began traveling uh, uh, around the world, starting with Peru, South America. And there was amazing power from the first moment from 
the first meetings, blind eyes were opening, cripples were walking, and I was like, whoa, I had no idea that that was uh, available at that level that quickly. And so that's that's when ministry and life uh, started for me. Let me ask you this question, because I always love to hear how somebody like yourself who got so dynamically touched in revival, in renewal by the presence and power of God, I really know that you've been carrying a torch, oh goodness, now well over 10 years for the seven mountains. How did that really so burn in your spirit? And that is, um, I, I love telling that part. I'm glad you asked that question. So I don't have to try to fit it in on my own because it's very important for where we're going with whatever we talk about prophetically. But, you know, I did see the presence and power of God and, and uh, immediately, uh, you know, all invitations, all ministry came from that. And so we did small churches, medium churches, large churches, central squares, coliseums, stadiums. And so in just a handful of years, we were seeing thousands of people saved and thousands of people healed of every conceivable disease. And, and it was really amazing. We took teams. I think we took over 100 teams. We had teams of up to uh, 40-something people, and they would all see miracles as well, praying for people. And the, But the moment of shift and change for me came two or three years into it. I would come back around to a city where we had gone and the power of God had just nailed it. And there had been so many healed, so many saved, so many delivered of demons. And, and so I came to the city and there was just a, a, an awareness just looking at it as like the city didn't change at all. And even looking for the ones who had gotten saved, it was hard to identify exactly where they were. And and um, and I realized the city was just as poor as when I left it. There was just as much joblessness as when I left it. There was just as much corruption. And I realized society hadn't changed at all. And so it began a, a journey of uh, many years with the Lord because I, I realized I had had a paradigm that if enough people got saved, if we did enough crusades and enough people got saved or healed, we would see a city or a nation change. And I realized through my own studies on revival and, and my reality that this was not happening, that there was not it was not splicing into this, what I now know, the seven mountains. But I didn't have a I didn't have a paradigm for it. I didn't have a template for it. And so I, I was wrestling with God. I would take teams. We would tell testimonies. It was a weird contradiction because inside I was dissatisfied. But we were seeing how can you be too dissatisfied when you're seeing all these miracles and having people excited about being on teams with you. But it was just that I, 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 my faith had now been kindled to the next level. I was reading the more dangerous scriptures, you know, ask of me the nations for an inheritance. And Isaiah 60, nations will walk to the light of the sons of God. And I was like, this isn't going there. This isn't going there. And so uh, the, the, the abruptness of how that was not going, me, me realizing that this was not going there, I, I realized I was just missing a piece of the template. So it was in, in August of 2006. It was started with one night. And it really just a visitation of the presence of the Lord. And he just came and said, tonight, is, I'm going to show you how my kingdom's coming. You've been asking. And, and he says, in the same way the children of Israel had to go into a promised land where there are seven enemy nations greater and mightier than them, the Hittites, Jebusites, Girgashites, all the ites. He said, the promised land that you have is occupied by enemies, enemies greater and mightier than you. And really for every night, for I think months, for hours, there would be interaction with the Lord and he would speak and he would put me on a study quest. And so some of it was study and then come back and pick up and then more presence. And, but out of it came really my first book that was released in 2008, the seven mountain prophecy, which has gone around, the world now in multiple languages, but the seven mount prophecy um, is what laid out how their each each area of society connects with one of the ites from the children of Israel. So the Hittites were from media. The Hittites mean fear or terror. And so that's what the enemy uses in the mountain of media, the Canaanites mountain of economy. And so there was an application for each one of them and strategy of the enemy that came. So that first book was primarily just revelation, not really interaction with the mountains, not really experience with it. I had had some experience already ministering 
to uh, prophetically, it was out of the prophetic gift that I had interacted with government leaders at some level already. And so the Lord was taking me back and, and having me realize that the cities and regions that the greatest change had come is where I had been able to reach the people that were in those seven mountains when they had been able to shift and change and change some things. And so, uh, you know, when I when I uh, was writing the book, I did not know the theme of the seven mountains existed at all. Uh, I thought this was totally just me and God. In fact, I knew it was powerful the way I was getting and what I was getting. And I remember telling him and saying, Lord, this this stuff is uh, you, you needed to give this to somebody already more established. You needed to give this to a famous writer, author. This needs to run. And he just said, you take care of your part. I'll take care of my part. You know, so it was from that that I was then introduced. I heard about Lance Well now and uh, he didn't have a book on it, but that he had a message on the seven mountains. Somebody that went to my church, walked up to me after I was preaching to our local church for the fourth time on the uh, I was on the fourth mountain, I think. And he says, you know, there's a man named Lance Wall now, and he has a message called the Seven Mount Strategy. And I'm like, no. Like what? Like the Seven Mountains of Jerusalem, Seven Mountains of Rome? He goes, no, the exact same Seven Mountains you're talking about. I go, no. He goes, yeah, he got it from Lauren Cunningham and uh, Bill Bright, uh, YWAM and Campus Crusade. And I was like, what? I know about them. I, I didn't know about Lance, but I knew about them, and I had never heard about that uh, portion of the minute, I was like, they definitely didn't understand it the way I did because you could not make it a fringe side matter of your ministry once you understand it. So anyway, that's how we got there. I love that. You know, Johnny, one of the things that I'm so grateful for with you is that you have been a voice of great sanity in the body of Christ right now because I know there's all sorts of interesting prophetic perspectives and thoughts every which way concerning right now the coronavirus, the COVID-19 situation. But it's funny, even right now when I'm talking about that or I'm talking and doing a prophetic talk with somebody, I'm like, yeah, I, I understand that it's the backdrop of what we're dealing with right now, but I don't want to exalt that to an undue position. And I think there's been a lot of that. You've really, I, I feel like the Lord really gave you a word. That's one of the wonderful reasons we got to do this great book with you. And I'm going to see if my technology will cooperate and I will put up, ah, there we go. That's brilliant. I got a picture from the cover, the end of the world as we know it. Johnny, I think I saw that on Facebook and then I saw it on Elijah list, you sharing that. And I thought to myself, this is truly a word. This is going to, it's going to be sound so funny. Number one, I'm familiar with the old song. It's the end of the world as we know it. Number two, I thought to myself, so many prophets that I know are legitimate have been prophesying a reset or a new era. I believe in that. Um, but then we had all this kind of stuff happen. And when I started seeing you release this word, I thought, this, I believe, is a strategy. This is a blueprint that the Lord is giving us to navigate us into this new era many have been talking about. So, uh, Johnny, just letting all of our folks know, the book is available now. There's a paperback version. There's an e-book version. It's on Amazon. It's excellent, a quick read, but a profound, impactful read. Johnny, an honor to do it with you. I, I want to give you the floor to share this word as Holy Spirit has given it to you. Well, thank you so much, Larry. Yeah, I, I believe it's been, it's important. You know, I feel like I have a scripture talks about sons of Issachar. They had understanding of the times, and that's just something the Lord just told me that uh, you know I'm supposed to function in that in that area and so he has to speak to me in that way and so it's you know what Israel was was to do and it's so easy to misread uh, the times and pretty much what I'm used to for decades now is anytime there's any challenge around the world there's an echo of uh, prophets and wannabe prophets and scared people that are announcing the end of days, the tribulation, the rapture, Jesus is coming, something other than what really is next. And part of my message has been, you know, what he was saying before the coronavirus, he's still saying. Uh, a, a key passage I, I, I spoke into in the, in the book itself, as a part of one chapter in the book, is out of Mark 4, where Jesus gets his disciples and he says, we're crossing very well-known story. You know, it says 
a furious squall developed, depending what version of the Bible you have. And there was a storm and they thought that they were going to die. And Jesus is said he's sleeping on a cushion. He found a cushion. And he's sleeping. And so they wake him up. Master, do you not care that we're going to die? Do you not care that we're not going to the other side? And um, and so, you know, he calms the storm, peace to the storm. He upbraids them for their little faith. And we understand that the reason it was uh, uh, considered little faith because, well, I say maybe perhaps what we hadn't noticed is, you know, he started it all with we're crossing over to the other side. He was the prophet of the day. And we point out for this year, it's been emphasized prophetically by many sources, Second Chronicles 2020. Listen to the Lord. You'll be established. Listen to his prophets. You'll prosper. And Jesus was the prophet as well. He's the apostle. He's the prophet. He's them all. And he had prophesied direction to them. He said, we're crossing over to the other side. And so, therefore, that was why he upbraided them for, uh, uh, for their little faith. And so a word I've had for us and for the body of Christ is I noticed that certain prophetic voices and people who had had, you know, great words for the years and saw for this year. And it was more headed towards end of days. It had gloom and judgment and all this. And, and, and so, you know, a wisdom I got and what I was sharing and I share in the book is that while you're in the storm, it's really not the time to get a fresh word. You start with you get you go with the word before the storm, the directive you were. And so my word is the coronavirus, the COVID-19, whatever it is, it is not the defining event of this of this year it is the storm of this year but we are crossing over he has said we're crossing over we have known i have released uh, several prophetic words from 2019 2020 and i found some other prophetic voices have said the same thing that this is a hinge time in history we will be known as before and after this time in history and 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 so there is a crossing over that was going to take that is taking place at this time and so what was true before the virus is still true. There are some things that are never supposed to be the same again. If if this is a history defining time and moment where it's a before and after, we all had to know that something big was going to take place. What would it be that would cause this big shift in society? And I think we are seeing that there is an awakening of the populace of the world. It's amazing what's taking place. And there's an awakening to righteousness. There's uh, an awakening to plots of the enemy, of a destructive um, depopulation agenda. Uh, really, uh, information has come out that tells about, you know, dark darkness, uh, deep darkness, as it says in Isaiah 60, that's had plots against us. And so many things are being revealed. And I'm hearing it from my friends in countries all over the world, multiple languages coming out. So in the midst of this time and season of exposure, it's still a time we're crossing over. And what looks like a storm, an interruptive storm, will end up being a catapultive storm. And I, th I think that's the, uh, the good news of what's happening. I should throw in right here, Larry, since you're, uh, you're in Dallas, we have a friend there. Um, I don't know if you know Will and Haviland Ford. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know if you've seen the, uh, it's been an amazing prophetic dream. Their seven-year-old boy uh, has had his first released, uh, you know, I think he's been in Charisma and in Elijah, uh, Elijah list. But from about six days ago, he had had first two nights in a row, then three nights in a row, the exact same dream. And essentially in the dream, and it's a conversation he had, I think, with the, his mom that the Lord had showed him that, it's the, the, the you know the crisis the coronavirus crisis would be over April 30th and um, and then he had it the fourth consecutive night and then I actually right before the program tonight will contacted me and said Johnny my son has had the exact same dream the last two nights it's now six nights in a row but for the last three consecutive nights the coronavirus plant that he saw that was squeezing the world, has become smaller and smaller and smaller every time. And I can feel that happening even in the spirit realm. You can feel the grip of the thing. I don't know about if you can feel that too, Larry, the, the, the grip of the fear, the grip of the crisis, the, uh, the grip 
of the weaponized plan of the enemy to what he had intended to use it, it's been broken. And so um, that's, that's, that's the good news. And so, yeah, the book, besides that, time is not forever here, but the scripture, second Chronicles 2020, which was big for this year because it's the year 2020. Uh, it, it was a great scripture and many take it as, yes, we listen to the prophets and we prosper, but we miss the context of second Chronicles 20 and second Chronicles 20 is a big test. It's a storm. It was a storm for Jehoshaphat, the King of Judah. And all of a sudden he finds himself surrounded by the Moabites, the Ammonites, and there is an innumerable army that he knew was too big for him. And it just suddenly came a very similar kind of that storm scenario as well. And so it said he feared because this was a big army and he called really an assembly together. And out of it, there was a man, Jehaziel, the prophet. And Jehaziel means literally his name means he who watches God and God watches him. There's this mutually going back and forth. And so he had God's perspective on the matter. And as they're in fear, his word is very simple. You shall not fear. Uh, the battle is the Lord. This is the Lord's battle. You will go to the battlefield, but you will not have to fight. Out of that, a strategy came. Uh, Jehoshaphat, the king, led the, with the strategy that they would put the praisers, the worshipers, Judah, would go before them. And so as Judah and praise went before, they they did not have to fight the battle. They did have to go to the battlefield, but they did not need to engage in the war. And it says, and as they praised and worshiped, the enemy began to fight themselves, began to take themselves out till there was none of them left. And I think that's so insightful for us. And we, we often think of praise being that which takes out the enemy, but it really looks like in that situation, perhaps in this situation, we praise God, we magnify him, we gaze at him, because as we do that, our own fear gets suppressed. And when our fear gets suppressed, as in their case, then the enemies of the the armies, the enemy armies begin to take each other out. And so uh, it's it should not be a surprise with all of us having seen that Second Chronicles 2020 was a key verse for the whole year that we would have a Second Chronicles 2020 scenario surrounding it. So when it said, listen to the prophets, it was the prophet Jehaziel, he who watches what God's doing. So I think we're in the midst of this where he's asking us to participate in some way. But it's more in suppressing fear, praising him, and the Lord is doing some bigger things than we could possibly pull off ourselves. I love that as well, the meaning of his name, the one who watches God. Um, I, I really think that's one of the most important things we could ask ourselves in the midst of any crisis is, God, what are you doing? Because it's so easy, John, I mean, for us to react. And I think that's where we get some of our, our goofy end time stuff sometimes. And believe me, folks, we believe Jesus is coming back. We believe in all of that. But the reality is this. I believe right now many reputable theologians are saying, no, this is, these are not the final bowls of wrath being poured into the earth. These are not the final plagues. If anything, this is a season where in the midst of all this, I do believe, Johnny, that that word the Lord has given you about this, this is the end of things as we have known them. Because, and, and the language you used at the beginning of the prophetic word you were talking about, I mean, we have barely begun to scratch the surface of what kingdom age looks like, operating in the fullness of the kingdom. So we've got a few, I, we could go all night, Johnny, this is great. But could you explain behind why that language, the end of the world as we know it? Very intriguing. Well, I believe, uh, you know, in the end of the world, as we know, there, this is such a unique time in that, you know, for every other uh, historical moment we can think of, whether you go back to the Protestant Reformation and, you know, Martin Luther, he's, he's nailing the 95 theses on the, on the door of the Wittenberg Chapel. You go back to Azusa Street and you have William J. Seymour. Uh, you know, having meetings in a humble place and a small amount of people to start with. And and uh, or we go even to, you know, we just passed the shot heard around the world, the American Revolution. First person that made that had that took that shot, had no idea it would resonate throughout history forever. And so one of the things I've observed is that, you know, it's it's rare to know you're going through history when you're doing it or that a history making moment is happening. 
But for some reason, I think this time the Lord went out of his way to make sure that we knew it was. And something about it being the year 2020, something about him calling a man named Trump and having prophesied about him for years before he was ever considered a political candidate. There are things that um, have uh, have lined up. And, and, and as you observe them, you say, oh, my goodness, God really wanted us to know we are in the moment in a crux of history. And and that's his first word when he sh- uh, showed me that President Donald Trump was going to be president. I was not too sure that he was supposed to be the man. I thought it was going to be a little rough if he was in. And so as as I was seeing the vision of him winning uh, as March 6th of 2016, I was saying, oh, no. And and the Lord said, he's going to save you from things you don't know you need to be saved from. And I'm putting him in and I'm putting a Cyrus anointing on him because that's what has to happen right now. There is a Babylon structure on the top of the seven mountains that has a depopulation agenda to take out most of you. And if I didn't put him there, a lot of you would be in a lot more problems than you imagine. But this is a new era. He said, next thing he said to me, he says, your nation will be known as before Trump and after Trump. And the world will be known as before Trump and after Trump. And it's not about Trump, he said. It's about me. Even as Trump, the name is, you know, there's the trumpet Trump, but then it's it's the highest playing card you can play with. And he's like, I'm letting you know, I'm letting powers and principalities know whatever ace they think they're pulling out of their sleeve, whatever set of cards they're laying down, I'm coming with Trump. And I'm coming and I am I am the one. It's about the card player and the card player is God at this time. So the new era we're going into is the kingdom age. And it's about the lamb's agenda for nations being satisfied, the reward for his suffering. And he the reward for his suffering is not just individuals going to heaven. That's a wonderful thing. But he even you know, we like to apply Psalms 2, 8 to ourselves. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations for an inheritance. But it was the father asking the son that. And the son did ask for the nations as his inheritance. And he paid for it with his own blood. He pr- paid the, the severe price for every single person. But he recovered all authority in heaven and on earth. And it was now his. And so out of it, we understand that he has a heart for the nations and for seeing nations that serve him well, that love him well. And so we're going to see sheep nations and we're going to see the agenda of the lamb accelerated. We're going to see a move of God uh, as never before, not the way we've, you know, we, we, we know about revivals. We know about things where people get saved and, and, but we don't know about where entire nations begin to operate to the light of the sons of God. And that's what we're headed for. And that's what uh, my my heart is excited about. And, you know, it's so many other words over the years he's given me about that, including, you know, just to go ahead and hit the big bomb that we're going to see 153 sheep nations. That's what we're headed towards. And so this is what kicks in now. This is the new era. It's the equivalent of crossing the Jordan River after having crossed the Red Sea and doing circles in the wilderness. You could say we've had circles in the wilderness and we're saying, Jesus, return, please return, please return. He's like, no, you're crossing over the Jordan River. You have promised land. You have to take in the spirit cities and nations. You take by influencing with love, with his presence, with his solutions. And we have accelerated him to this day of reformation, this day of renaissance. And it's going to be with us for I, a significant period of time. You know, it's interesting. One person, I think this is a good place for us to kind of conclude, but somebody was asking a question in the chat. What are sheep nations? And it is interesting because I think of the traditional idea that we have when Jesus said, I'm going to divide. But Jesus, we've got to always look at context. We've got to look at language. If we're going to do an honest study of scripture, Jesus was using the context of nations. So Johnny, when giving an explanation of sheep and goat nations, how would you define that? Well, again, there's there's a bit of uh, uh, you can't go deeper than it actually says it there. And it's hard to you know, what does the quantifiers exactly make you a difference between a sheep and a goat nation? And, you know, it tells you there's something about caring for the least of these. Those will become sheep nation. But, you know, ultimately it becomes his judgment call. I don't know that we can judge it from our end. We just have to rise on the mountains of society. We have to take solutions. We have to take his presence. We have to be salt and light, not just in the church. And I think it just means at some point, the sons and daughters of the king can carry so much light in society, can carry so much light in an entire nation 
that a nation gets considered, this is a sheep nation. This nation gets recognized before God as a nation that's following the king of kings. And so conversely, a goat nation would be one, you know, goats, they're just known for being stubborn. And so a, a sheep is, we surrender. Goats, we don't surrender. We want our own way. We're going, we're doing our own thing. And I think, you know, the differentiation is going to be pretty close. We're not going to have to wonder. I was like, are they 51% sheep, 49? It's like, I think they're going to be night and day difference between the two. And so it, it won't be hard to judge as we move into the future. I know. I agree. And really, we kind of look at a nation and where does that nation? It doesn't mean a Christianized nation. Just by right. the way, it doesn't mean every single person is, is becomes a believer. But I do believe it has something to do with the culture of that nation, the political, the government of that nation and and its posture towards Judeo Christian community values, that type of thing. I, mean, I, I don't want to oversimplify, but um you know, Johnny, I, I again, we're, we're out of time, but I'm so grateful for this message. I believe it's timely. I encourage you, for those of you who are who are continually intrigued about what does this mean, the end of the world as we know it, I just encourage you to get a copy of the book. Again, it's like $6.99 on Kindle. It's a quick read, available for those of you who like the physical books. I still like those books, but available in both formats. It will be a blessing to you. And again, I think it will be a great resource to help navigate you through what God is doing. Because, Johnny, this is what I so appreciate about this. And again, I can't express how excited we are to partner with you on this. I know a lot of people right now, even with the attempt to help us, there's almost too much exaltation or focus on the crisis. Now, we don't want to stick our head in the sand and pretend nothing's happening. But at the same time, when I, as a publisher, when I'm looking for books, particularly on current events, I'm looking for people who carry prophetic solutions, okay, or, or a strategy. How will something navigate us out of where we are into the place God has told us he is calling us? And, you know, Johnny, you've done that so well with this, and we're so grateful for it. Well, thank you so much, Larry. My last comment is the coronavirus will be bred for us. And oh. uh, it, is, it, is, it has been good to be with you. Oh, it's, and again, great having you on. Again, the end of the world as we know it. It is available now on Amazon. I do encourage you, and I actually believe, Johnny, I have your website right here. It's www.restore7.org, restore7.org, where you can learn about Johnny and Elizabeth Enlau. They've got all sorts of amazing resources. You guys, very briefly, I mean, what you, you guys do a little bit of everything. What is the overall mission objective of your ministry? All right. We had a, 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 a pause there, but I think I picked up what, what you said, the overall objective focus of our ministry. Yep. It's called Restore 7, and it's about restoring seven areas of society. There's a face of God to be made evident in every area of society. God is communicator in media. God is teacher in education. God is provider in the economy. God is king, government, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so it is, it's an assignment on the seven mountains. And so we have uh, resources, books. We're coming up with uh, an app uh, real soon this year that will connect a global community called RISE, Global Community. RISE stands for Reformers Influencing Society Every Day. Our heart and passion is to raise up reformers. 97% of the church is not called to a, 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 a traditional ministry assignment within the four walls of the church. It's only 3% will ever be missionaries, pastors, evangelists, worship leaders. And so the 97% who aren't quite sure what their ministry is, that's supposed to be activated and, and it's, made, it's to be made revealed in the seven mountains of society. And so part of our message is to validate those who are already there. And part of it is to call people out of being the 97 percent who are just watching and spectators to join that movement. And so we believe that's how we fulfill Jesus' original message of being salt and light. And that um, and so everything that we have, all our resources and we have uh, many, the books and the app will all be designed to uh, uh, be able to connect this global community and then allow us to see us activated, deployed into every area of society, joining with all the other ones that are already doing good kingdom things in every area of society. And I don't know if we're froze. We have a little glitch. I could keep talking.